The title of tonight's talk, by the way, is Imagining Ireland in the 2040s. Uh, when I started work here three years ago, uh, I was very much thinking about uh, imagining Ireland in the 2020s. And then I changed it after a while to the 2030s. And I was preparing the slides for this evening. I said, I'm going to go for the 2040s. And the reason, I think, is that actually 30 years um, is nothing. Believe me, uh, <laughs> I should know. Um, and I'm going to come back to that point because the time scale for economic and social change is important, particularly if we're looking at the matter from the perspective of change and what our role might be in bringing about change. We might be here as trade union activists, uh, activists in some civil society organizations, or concerned citizens uh, who vote, who take part in civil society. And uh, in my view, the interesting part of economics is how it helps us to understand the world, but especially how to change the world, because it does need changing. I hope you agree. Uh, if you don't agree, well, um, well, we'll have to agree to disagree. So, three questions. Where are we economically and socially? What social vision is possible and desirable uh, over the next 30 years? And I'd be interested to hear your perspective and views on this. Uh, and thirdly, what sort of strategy, economic, political strategy, is required to get there? Okay. Okay, so um, just a few comments in terms of where we are at. Um, I think it's sometimes good to be positive uh, and to emphasize the positive achievements and gains that have been made in Irish society in spite of all the problems, uh, in spite of all the injustices and inequalities. There have been huge improvements in, for example, living standards over the last 50 years, uh, in conditions of health and education. And those of us uh, uh, who remember, you know, uh, the 1960s, the 1970s, uh, you can see a huge difference in conditions of housing uh, and, as I've mentioned, also health. Even the physical infrastructure in the country in terms of buildings, uh, motorways, transport, you can see significant differences. Uh, I've travelled a lot myself between Belfast and Dublin in the 1980s. I used to work there for a little while. And you were always struck by the sharp contrast once you crossed the border from, from Northern Ireland into the Republic. You slowed down from 50 miles an hour to 30 miles an hour because if you hit a pothole in a country road in Cavan or Louth, uh, you would wreck your chassis or your, or your suspension. It, it happened to me. And, um, and you know, you would never imagine that eventually we would get to a point where the roads are actually better now in the Republic than in Northern Ireland. Uh, you actually put the foot down on the pedal, I have to admit, once you cross the border into the Republic, nice big open dual carriageway road and away you go. Um, and, um, and that's reflecting actually a process of underinvestment in infrastructure in Northern Ireland. Uh, it has improved but very little and in some cases the secondary roads have disimproved. But I'm just merely trying to make the point that there have been huge changes, some of them for the better, also rapid changes in technology, in trade, in health, education, demography. Um, just to do maybe a little bit of a, um, a mind exercise for a few seconds, um, um, I'm just going to uh, forward this to, um, to uh, the following slide. Um, not sure uh, if you remember 1984, I do. Um, and just stop for a minute and think, um, like, if I was to say to you, if we were meeting in this room in 1984, okay, and I said to you, um, in 20 years' time, or a little bit more, uh, Sinn Féin and the DUP would be in government together in Stormont, uh, you'd say, no, nah, that'll never happen. You must be mad. Uh, if I said to you that within five years the Berlin Wall would be gone, no shooting, no massacres, no wars, uh, just an implosion of the Soviet and communist regimes in Eastern Europe, okay, there was a bit of trouble in Romania, and then there was a civil war in Yugoslavia, okay. That aside, you know, just the collapse of Eastern Europe uh, as we knew it, uh, and the Iron Curtain that came right down through the centre of Europe, 
uh, and that was the situation for two or three decades. Would have said, mad, never. That's not going to happen that quickly anyway. Um, if I said to you, um, uh, in 30 years' time, we're going to have little gadgets in our pocket, and we'll be able to check the news and the weather, and the time of the bus from Alien Street in an hour's time, and I can uh, put up pictures, funny pictures on Twitter, and send emails to whoever, you'd say, I have no idea what you're talking about. Internet, something to do with phishing. Um, and it's transformed the way we work, the way we live. Uh, they reckon now that actually, in the UK anyway, that people spend more time looking at their smartphones than sleeping. Um, which, when you think about it, is probably true. If you look around the bus and the train in the morning, I find that out of ten people, probably eight or nine of them are actually looking at the, at the smartphone. Uh, the other two are asleep, you know. Um, that's, that's me, I'm the one asleep usually. Um, and then the Celtic Tiger. I mean, if I said to someone here in 1984 that the number of people in the workforce in Ireland was going to double from one million uh, at the time to two million by the year 2007, just before the crash, doubling of employment. Never happened before in the economic history of Ireland, you'd say, dream on, you know, because the 1980s, uh, were actually quite a depressed, uh, moribund um, time in, in, in the Irish economy. And then, you know, we had the Celtic Tiger, and if I said to you that world trade, global world trade would collapse by a third in the space of 12 months in 2009, uh, as sharp a fall as you had in 1929, 1930, during the Great Depression, you'd say, nonsense, that we now have the great moderation, uh, it was called, in America and in Britain, that we know how to regulate economic booms and busts, and uh, that we would never really ever again have a depression like we had in the 1930s. Which is true to some extent, because actually it has to be said that the response, uh, in particular of the US and the UK in 2009 and 10, uh, actually prevented uh, a depression of 1930 scale, so that you know is, is is something to be said. And then the Ireland of the 1980s, like um, well, you know, I don't have to tell you, but like there was a dodgy program called Father Ted, uh, and it wasn't allowed on RT. You know, pretty risky stuff. That was I think it was Channel Four that screened it first. You know, the transformation, of social values, and attitudes quite dramatic actually. When you think back over 30, 40 years what things that are now taken for granted and assumed and non-controversial would have been uh, really difficult issues uh, even just 20 or 30 years ago. So all of that has happened in the space of only 30 years. And here's my point. Can we imagine what the next 30 years is going to be like and what the world will be like, what Europe will be like? We really don't know um, if the past is an indication of the speed and unexpected nature of change, then we could be in for amazing surprises, good or bad, in the next 30 years. And no economist uh, can predict the future. Uh, no one can model the future mathematically. Uh, at best, we can say this could happen, there's a risk of that happening, there's a probability that the following will emerge, but we, can, we cannot actually predict the level of GDP. Uh, we cannot surmise what the map of Europe will even look like. We assume always that the map of Europe is stable. And when I was taught geography, uh, Europe was in two. There was an iron curtain running down the middle. The map of <coughs> Europe looks very different today. And we don't know exactly how that map will look in 30 years, particularly maybe in the eastern parts of, of, of the European map. So, uh, change is the constant, and I think it, it, it behoves us to be humble in the front of the truth that economic history, human history has shown us again and again the dramatic pace of change, sometimes slow, no change it would seem for many years, and then a dramatic sudden tipping point, and economically uh, that has huge implications as well. So I, I'm always skeptical when people say, you know, we're gloom, we're doomed, um, stagnation, um, 
uh, dysfunction, um, you know, capitalism cannot uh, recreate itself. Um, and we can see actually that, you know, that prognosis was, was fundamentally wrong uh, in the 1930s, in the 50s and 60s. Capitalism was able to, uh, to reimagine itself in, and recreate itself, not without huge institutional factors and concessions and compromises, it's true. Uh, at the same time, uh, the idea that markets will solve all problems and that we'll never again have a, a depression or a slump, well, the last six, six years have taught us that's not the case, actually. That uh, it's, in fact, the case that, in many ways, the global economy is more unstable and volatile now than ever before. Um, and that really poses a huge challenge uh, for, for national governments, as well as for uh, civil society organizations, sometimes organized at national level, but feeling almost powerless in the face of these global influences and forces. So, what sort of a social vision uh, might we consider for the future? And I think this is basic because uh, the interesting thing about the debate at the moment in Ireland is that it's very short term. Um, it's funny actually when you talk to people about long term economic strategy, they look at you and say, well, we have a plan for the next five years. And you kind of stop and think, but that's not long term, that's actually very short term. Uh, you ask people, what's your vision for Irish industry and services and public services in the 2040s? And no one really is seriously thinking about this. Um, our own Taoiseach is saying the best small country in the world in which to do business. Yeah, okay, but that's a pretty narrow parochial uh, expression, uh, you know. Um, expand on that, please, you know. The essay needs to be a page and a half, uh, uh, we might say. So give us, give us a bit more here. And I think that's important because in many ways, um, what's lacking now, I think, is a vision that actually puts human well-being at the center. Instead, uh, we very much organize our, our thinking and our planning around, um, around markets, around measures like GDP, around quantitative measures uh, you know, that meet particular objectives, but don't actually put human well-being at the center. Now, what do I mean by human well-being? And this, I admit, is a difficult to define concept. But I mean, for example, a situation where individuals and communities are flourishing, uh, where there is a high level of satisfaction and well-being, uh, where people are treated with respect and feel empowered to live the sorts of lives that they wish to live. And who could be against that, you might say. But actually, it's fundamentally important because it also means that people are free to choose uh, what sort of society they want. And I'll tell you an interesting uh, item I read recently, uh, only the other day, uh, where a group of um, analysts and commentators from Greece uh, were briefing investors in London about what's happening in Greece at the moment. I don't know whether you're following closely the situation in Greece. And what they said is that a spectre is haunting Greece, and therefore Europe, with this Syriza party possibly going to gain power in March. And the story uh, is that the investors were spooked, horrified by what they were hearing, because Syriza was talking, uh, the Syriza representatives were talking about something that was worse than communism, that was actually the phrase used by the Financial Times in its report, worse than communism. What were they, what were they referring to? Uh, was it uh, Gulag? Um, prisons? Uh, was it uh, torture chambers? No, 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 no. It was referring to a negotiated restructuring of Greek sovereign debt. Can you imagine that? A negotiated restructuring, write down of uh, a Greek sovereign debt. They were talking about a restoration of the real value of pensions to their level in 2007. And the conclusion drawn in this short analysis. Uh, and the story has grown legs in the last 48 hours if you look at the FT and other media outlets. And the view taken really is that this is really troubling for Europe 
that a sovereign people, the Greek people, and don't forget democracy started, I suppose you could say, demos in Greece, are actually uh, wanting to make choices uh, that put the well-being of Greek citizens at the center of their economic and social uh, uh, politic. And this is actually deeply disturbing for global markets and global institutions that have a completely different agenda um, uh, to, to, to what I'm talking about. So in fact, um, when it is necessary for a nation state to incorporate into its constitution a fiscal rule that says you cannot have a deficit, a structural deficit of more than 0.5% of your GDP, or you cannot in the long term have a level of debt to GDP of more than 60%. When that rule is incorporated into your constitution and you go looking for provisions on human rights such as a right to housing, a right to uh, employment, a right to free speech, a right to um, a decent level of education and health, when instead um, arbitrary rules about matters that economists do not agree economists do not agree on how to measure the structural deficit. When those rules are written into our constitution by a referendum of the Irish people under threat of the withdrawal of international uh, aid and uh, bailout funds, uh, I'm talking about the fiscal treaty of 2012, under a direct threat uh, the Irish people were compelled, uh, in my view, to adopt uh, fiscal rules that make no sense economically and politically, make no sense. Uh, these rules are nonsense uh, because the structural deficit is impossible to measure. Uh, it's based on arbitrary assumptions about long-term structural unemployment. And these are now incorporated into Bonroch uh, and are given um, supremacy, uh, in my view, over uh, measures of human well-being. Personal efficacy, again, the importance uh, uh, of the individual in a social community setting and individual rights are important and again this might seem obvious and you know why are we spending time going into this well again the constitution uh, our constitution which was written in 1937 reflected the mores and values of ireland in the 1930s hence the concept or idea of an individual child having rights as distinct from the family uh, to which the child belonged was, uh, was foreign uh, at that time, actually, to the people uh, in the way they thought about these issues. So it was necessary for us to think about this and to incorporate uh, some provision uh, that recognized <coughs> children's rights, although I'm not altogether sure what it really means in practice, I have to say, but anyway, uh, at least some progress in thinking has happened. The sustainability agenda is absolutely crucial. Um, What is the single most important um, <coughs> problem facing us, facing Ireland, facing the world? Uh, can we agree? Uh, it's the environment. I mean, uh, we won't have equality, we won't have public services, uh, we won't have income or productivity if uh, our environment is trashed and irre irrevocably damaged as a result of human behaviour. And the evidence, scientifically, is overwhelming that human behavior is having a detrimental effect on the environment. The problem here, uh, to some extent at least, is that it's a global issue that does not, cannot be resolved at nation state level. So countries have to cooperate uh, to deal with this problem, however that may be done. It could involve radical changes to the structure of taxation so that production and consumption our um, patterns of production and consumption are changed. It could also uh, involve radical changes to the way that we live and uh, travel and consume and to the way, for example, that buildings um, are constructed and maintained and heated. For example, the building that we're in uh, has single glazed windows, so it's much more expensive to heat this room than if it was double glazed. Retrofitting, for example, is an important <coughs> measure to actually conserve and make better use of energy, uh, particularly in a, in a country like Ireland, where we are so heavily dependent on fossil fuel imports. 
So sustainability, the importance uh, of renewable sources of energy and more ecological uh, approach to industry and production is really crucial to a vision for the 2040s. Adequacy of income and employment. It's difficult to measure what is a basic adequate income. Um, there are different ways of doing this uh, and it's linked also to the living wage research uh, agenda and you may have heard something, something about that from, from my colleague Michal Collins when he spoke to you some weeks ago. But it's very important I think because um, one of the good things I suppose about the political economy debate in Ireland compared to the UK is that there is still some level of um, decency, uh, this is my opinion at least, uh, so that when someone dies on the street outside the parliament, okay, it's outside the parliament, it's outside the Dáil, there's a big fuss, okay? And there is a view still in Ireland for, for some reason that you know, poverty isn't just the fault of people who are poor, in fact it's not the fault, it's, it's to do with injustices and lack of access and fairness uh, to housing, education, health, and that therefore society should provide a basic decent level of income to people who are unemployed or sick or old. Now, I don't want to exaggerate the point, but I think there is actually a level of consensus around these issues and you become aware of that when you go to other countries in Europe, like, for example, our neighbour across the water, the UK. The attitude and mentality now, uh, many, many people uh, go talk about Benefit Street and food banks. Why do you want food banks? I mean, that's just going to make people lazy. Uh, they need to go out and work and get a job. And a lot of people in many European countries, including, uh, particularly, I have to say, Central and Eastern Europe, their attitude towards people who are um, homeless, who are unemployed, who are uh, not able to, to participate in the labour market, for example, is extraordinarily, it's informed sometimes by irrational racist beliefs about particular groups uh, and immigrant groups. And I think this is something that you know, we need to be careful about. Uh, obviously, values and attitudes can change in Ireland. But we need a debate about what constitutes an adequate level of income and, and, and housing and accommodation as well for people. Um, and again, there is quite a bit of research done on this. I, I won't go into the detail of it. The quality of work experience is very important. We now have increasingly a precarious workforce, particularly for younger people who have joined the labour force or the workforce in recent times, uh, with inferior contracts in regards to pensions, tenure, as well as pay rates. Sometimes we have two-tier, three-tier workforces, even within the public service. And this is something that hasn't happened before and is deeply worrying. The quality of work experience is a crucial challenge, I think, for trade unions in particular. And I know there are some uh, 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 people from the trade union side in this class, so this will be a particularly interesting point. And then there is the question of access to social goods. And I really want to emphasize this point, actually, uh, just keeping an eye on the time. Um, <clears throat> you see, when people talk about living standards and um, incomes, uh, the focus very much is on cash in your pocket. Um, so if the issue, for example, is about early childhood education and care, and we're not very good at that here compared to other European countries, the solution that people very often think about, right, let's have a tax cut, let's put more money and cash into the pockets of families, and they can choose how to use that money to buy um, early childhood care or to invest in the children's education or whatever. So relative to many other European countries, child benefit, universal child benefit, seems generous in Ireland actually. Uh, and also, you know, there, 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 there will be other supports and benefits of, of a direct cash transfer nature. The problem that, however, arises is that we don't sometimes understand enough the importance of social goods and services, education, health, early childhood education and care being, being one of them as well. These goods and services very often are provided 
on a more or less universal basis in, in certain other European countries, less so in Ireland. It's shocking uh, to many Europeans to learn that in Ireland we have a three-tier uh, health service, a medical card, people who can't afford private health insurance but still you know, don't qualify for a medical card, and then those who are fortunate enough to pay for private health insurance in order to skip the queue, to be quite blunt about it, and get treatment earlier. And that's profoundly uh, undemocratic, but it's the way it is in Ireland. And, and sometimes people feel they don't have a choice. Uh, if, if, if they can afford to purchase private health insurance, then they do so. I was talking to a taxi driver the other day in his 70s, and he says, ah, he says, I do a few hours every morning. He said, it pays for the private health insurance. You know, when you get to my age, there's always a, um, a hip or something that you have to, to worry about, you know. And fair dues, like, you know, uh, you, you can see why he would spend uh, three or 4,000 a year on a private health insurance package. But uh, if, uh, if, you, if you go up the road to Newry, uh, people like to compare us with Newry. Oh, look, Newry, the dole is only 70 pounds a week there for single people, and you've got 180 euro, and your wages are, are double what, what they are in the north. Uh, it's true, actually, our wages down here are 50% higher on average than in, the, in Northern Ireland. But then I said to people in the north, I said, tell me, I said, do you have private health insurance? Oh, no, no. I, says, I was talking to a third level lecturer there the other day, actually, in, uh, in a certain university. I said, really? And I said, tell me, how many of your colleagues have private health insurance? God, no, I don't know of anyone who has private health insurance. So interesting contrast. In, in the UK, perhaps only one in 10 would have private health insurance. The ratio here, I think, would be 40-something percent. So really important that we have a discussion in Ireland about social goods and services, and not just about cash in the pocket. And I'm going to come back to that point uh, in, in, in a few minutes. Um, just a word about employment rates. Uh, this is to do with the proportion of the population in employment, the proportion of the working age population in employment. And sometimes people get very uh, worked up about ageing societies. Actually, we don't have a lot to worry about in Ireland until at least the 2030s, okay? Because we were 15, 20 years behind all the other countries. Our birth rate didn't decline, actually, until the early 1980s. And in fact, it kind of went up for a while after 1994. But, but there is an issue in the long term, uh, that people are living longer, and also that the shape, the demographic shape, is changing. Uh, one of the interesting things about the recession, actually, is that, um, and very few people have focused on this, is that there's been a very high net outward migration amongst, um, amongst young Irish people in their 20s, but particularly females. Uh, and uh, guess what? Traditionally, females uh, in recent times have gone into third level and very often have ended up working in the education or health sectors. And those are the sectors that were hit by the moratorium on public sector recruitment. So it's my view that, that a lot of that uh, surge in net outward migration amongst females <coughs> is recession related. And um, that will affect demography in 30 years time, actually. One of the reasons births were so high in the last 10 years is that uh, females who were born in the 1970s and 80s turned 20-something, 30-something. So quite apart from the fertility rate, there was an increase in births. Anyway, point is that the employment rate in Ireland, uh, okay, down here, is below the EU average. And if we want to build up higher levels of productivity and social provision, we need to actually aim to get up there towards the top. Sweden, Germany, UK, Netherlands, Austria and Denmark. But we can't do that with an inferior early childhood provision. We can't do that without a restructuring of the labour force and upskilling of particular groups. So here there is a challenge actually to create more work but better quality work and to increase employment rates. It doesn't necessarily mean that everyone has to be working full time but it does mean, actually, that a higher proportion of people need to be drawn into the workforce, and that has implications for other areas of social policy. If we look at recent trends for males and females in Ireland, Republic of Ireland, when I say Ireland, actually, I mean Republic of Ireland, but, but, uh, but sometimes I refer to the North as well uh, uh, at the same time. Um, 
employment rates actually fell for, for men and women, uh, but particularly for men, and that was related there to the construction industry, that's the blue line. Um, where's my red dot? Yeah, you can see it there, I think. Is the red line showing? Anyway. Uh, blue for boys, um, red for females. And, um, and there you can see actually uh, a loss uh, in terms of employment rates. And that was quite severe actually. Only Spain or Greece had as sharp a reduction as that. Thankfully the rate is increasing again, but only gradually. It's a very gradual uh, recovery in employment rates. The other interesting thing uh, about the labour market uh, here in the Republic is that we have one of the most unequal wage distributions in the OECD. Uh, this is a measure of relative um, uh, wages, uh, incidence of low pay, the proportion, the, the proportion of workers uh, below two-thirds of the median wage. And I think Ireland, in this comparison, is the third highest uh, below Korea and, and Israel. The degree of inequality has increased. Uh, in this case, the example is between um, 2012 and 2003 to, uh, to say. Uh, so over that 10-year period, inequality increased, wage inequality, now I'm not talking about incomes, I'm talking about wages, which is a component of income, that has, it has increased. And that doesn't surprise because in the Anglo-Saxon countries, and apologies, I suppose we are part of that world, um, both in the public sector and in the private sector, over the last three decades, wages have, wage disparity has increased, okay? Uh, what it means, in effect, is that um, you've got a lot of low-paid workers, particularly in food, accommodation, retail, hotels, restaurants, that whole area of the economy, a lot of low-paid workers, uh, in some cases on 8, 9, 10 euro an hour, in fact, typically on less than 10 euro an hour in those particular sectors that I've mentioned. And they constitute uh, the low-paid sector of the Irish economy, they also happen to be the sectors with the lowest degrees of union density. Uh, so very often they're not in unions or a very small proportion are in unions. Now, what's been going on here in the last 20, 30 years? Um, well, one of the things that's been going on actually is that we've had, believe it or not, a certain degree of wage moderation. And I'm gonna show this in a minute. Um, uh, but just hold on to that idea. What did we get for wage moderation? We got income tax cuts. And what are we going to get in the next election? Promises of more income tax cuts, yeah? So here there's a 30 year cycle just about to repeat itself again. And we're going to come back to this because this is very interesting. The social wage I've mentioned already. And now I'm going to talk about the strategy that we need to get from where we are now to where we might be in 30 years' time. It's coming up to five to seven, and I, I really would like to leave a little bit of time for discussion. So I'm going to go through this quickly. Um, these are just headings, you know, and you could write a book under each of these headings. Um, I mean, let me just kind of pull out maybe um, three, economic democracy. What do I mean by economic democracy? Well, if you go back 30, 40 years, it was quite common uh, for trade unions, especially to talk about industrial democracy and worker directors and employee participation in the boards of firms. This whole discourse has almost vanished uh, in the meantime. In the Britain, it was very big. There was the Lord Bullock report. You might have heard of him. Um, and it was all about how enterprises and companies actually are made more accountable to uh, a, a range of actors, including employees in the company. In Germany, this was actually written into law or into agreements. You had co-determination, where you had a significant element of worker participation in the running of companies and enterprises. And part of the challenge in talking about a renewal of Irish economic policy is how different stakeholders, um, consumers, employees, uh, representatives of various uh, community and environmental interests are involved in the running of enterprises. And one of the major problems is that a lot of enterprises, including the cooperative movement, not just worker co-ops, but 
agricultural co-ops and other types of producer co-ops, um, as well as uh, mutuals in the area of credit and banking. Think of the League of Credit Unions, for example. A lot of these um, more kind of socially orientated uh, exercises or enterprises were bought out or yeah. changed fundamentally in the way that they operated. So what we have actually is less democracy in many ways and concentration of economic power in smaller numbers of enterprises. We can see this particularly in the area of banking and finance. Now, I'm not going to go on about banking, but I think banking is actually central to an economic strategy. Um, and again, it's amazing how everyone, well, almost everyone, assumes that Ireland is a small country, so we only need to pin our banks. And by the way, someone else can own them for us because they're kind of bankrupt at the moment. Well, AIB is anyway, and permanent TSB. And as soon as we can sell them off, we'll sell them off to someone, UBS or some, some, uh, some international financial um, company. And no thought has been given to what sort of a banking um, industry do we need in Ireland? One that provides a safe place to put your savings and a place that lends to enterprises and businesses like, for example, small and medium-sized enterprises. We used to have a thing called the Industrial Credit Corporation and the Agricultural Credit Corporation, but they were sold off and changed into, into something else. This is an opportunity for us, actually, to maybe do it differently. And then people say, ah, no, you can't do that. Europe won't allow you. What do you mean Europe won't allow you? In Germany, there are public banks in each lender. Um, there's a state development bank, bank called the KFW that's been there since the 1950s. That's a public bank, rather like our old ICC. And they lend huge amounts of money to small and medium-sized German enterprises. If the Germans can do it, why can't we do it? Uh, they're also in the European Union. Um, another interesting point uh, to, to, uh, to make here um, is social insurance. Um, Ireland is a way off the map on social insurance. We're completely abnormal. Um, uh, the, sorry. the reason uh, this is showing total social insurance as a proportion of GDP in 2012, and guess what? Uh, in, Ar in Ireland, PRSI, peer related social insurance, as a proportion of GDP, is the lowest uh, in Europe. The reason Denmark is different is, is that the trade unions in Denmark administer their social insurance scheme, so that's the reason they're low on this particular comparison. And this is a topic we're not allowed to talk about. Because once you start raising about employer PRSI, um, someone uh, starts getting up and shouting about, oh, that will increase business costs and drive away jobs and investment. You can't do that. In fact, uh, you should be cutting employer PRSI. But Irish employers contribute much less by way of PRSI than any other European country in this comparison, particularly France, although France is a special case. But again, this is fundamental because very often the focus is narrowly on income tax and why people need to cut income tax, uh, which I don't agree with, uh, I can tell you straight away. Um, and then we have this wonderful thing called the Universal Social Charge, USC. Um, now, we could have a really interesting conversation about this and uh, we probably don't have enough time, but I think USC is the best thing ever created. I'm going to be really provocative here. Yeah, USC is a wonderful tax. It's progressive, it's on all persons, it's on all income, it's not riddled with tax reliefs, uh, unlike income tax. And I think we need to increase USC, yeah, increase it and abolish income tax. <laughs> I said that during a briefing recently to Minister Noonan and Howland. I didn't know had I gone mad or something, and I said, yeah, I said, I said, you could create, you could collect all income tax, 16 billion euro, by an average USC levy of 18%. You could graduate it from 1% up to 50% on the richest top 10% of, 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 and then you could call it income tax. <laughs> That's the trick, you see? It's all those tax reliefs for pensions, for health, 
all that stuff. Um, I, I have an annual bus ticket uh, here. Um, uh, I'll show it to you. Um, and I get 52% tax relief on it because I pay the top uh, income tax rate. Um, a colleague who works with me comes in on the bus in the morning and he's on the, the lower rate. He gets, he gets tax relief at 30%. It's 20 plus, 20 plus 7 plus PRSI 3. It's about 30, 31% tax relief. Two people coming in from the same part of Dublin every morning and he pays two or three hundred euro more per annum than I do. What's that about? That makes no sense. Uh, uh, I'm complaining about this, actually. <laughs> so, and the tax code is riddled with that sort of stuff, from pension relief to other stuff. USC would clear it all up. Believe me, USC is the best thing ever created. Should low paid workers be paying USC? In my view, they should. But I'll tell you why. Uh, you see, I think everyone should pay USC, even people in poverty. And then what's taken in USC should be given back through a social transfer. Now, what's the sense of that? Um, why would you take with one hand and give with another hand? Because at the top of your pay slip, or whatever, um, whatever statement you get for, for your income, there's a little thing called universal social contribution. Uh, I prefer the word contribution to charge. You see, the important point here is the principle is that everyone should pay, but in accordance with their means. And by the way, I think that richer people should pay much more than they do now. I'm not, stop, not denying that. But I do think that USC, uh, I'm being provocative because I know this issue is controversial in the trade union movement, and I welcome a debate and a discussion about this. Um, now, um, I'm going to kind of move along quickly. Um, this, this you've seen already, I think, from my colleague Michal Collins. And this is actually a really interesting piece of data, in my view. Um, uh, what it's showing you is the estimated income tax paid by different kinds of people, single persons and couples. Uh, in 1997, 2008 and 2014. Now, this does not show the true actual amount of income tax paid. This shows you what people are supposed to pay uh, if they have no tax reliefs. So it factors in tax credits and PAYE tax credits. This example relates to PAYE actually. And there are some simplifying assumptions about couples and, and how they share their income. But in other words, these, these figures are actually overestimates of what people actually pay in income tax. But let's, let's assume it's, kind of, it's more or less true. And what this shows is that there was a huge change <coughs> um, between 1997 and 2008. Half the workforce was taken out of the income tax net. And every budget, the minister used to stand up and say, I have removed another 100,000 people from the income tax net. And everyone clapped. And we ended up in 2008 with the weirdest, most skewed income tax distribution in the OECD, and everyone was happy with it. And why did we do it? Because we traded it for wage moderation. And that's my point, that we've short-sold ourselves on social wage in return for more cash in the pockets through the illusion of tax cuts in exchange for lower wages and lower social wage. And by George, did we pay a price for that? And here's the point. We're going down that same road now, same discussion, and I'm hearing it in the trade union movement, and I'm depressed. I go home and I listen to Leonard Cohn, and I try not to read the newspapers, <laughs> and I come crawling out from under the bed, and I say, this can't be happened. I don't believe this, that we're heading into another election with the promise of tax cuts. We'll give you more tax cuts. We want the tax cuts for the workers, you want it for the rich, and so on and so forth. It really is awful because it is actually the repetition of the same mistakes that we made in the last 20 years. I'm very strong about this, but, uh, and, and I, I welcome disagreements and uh, discussion about this point. But the interesting thing is that in the space of 10 years, we hollowed out our own income tax system. Now, it has come back a bit in the last four or five years. But, but, but not, not dramatically. 
the actual income tax paid in 2014 as a proportionate income is much lower than it was in 1997, and that's not so long ago. How are we going to provide European social services, uh, I ask, without an adequate level of, of, of taxation? Of course, there are other areas of taxation, such as corporate tax, wealth tax, and we, that I, I fully accept that. Uh, and and that's, that, that is a, a very important point. But we also need uh, a significant revenue flow coming from income, and, and this is a crucial part of that. Um, okay, uh, I call this, by the way, the temptation of Odysseus. Odysseus, yeah. The, a poor chap was, uh, you know, the Greek myths, and um, he, they had to time up to the pole, and all these seductive sirens were coming from these mermaids. And the thing about poor Odysseus is that, you know, we're, sometimes we're a bit like Odysseus, like, ah, yeah, you know, Tom, you make sense, yeah, 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 but that doesn't, that doesn't win the popular support and votes. What wins elections is promises of tax cuts. And it's all over the world now. The Nordics have it. It's cut, cut, cut taxes. And the more you cut taxes, the more enterprise and economic activity you generate and it'll pay for itself and you've no option, you know, you, no one will support you. Who, who stands for tax increases in this country? Nobody. Mm. Joe Higgins, Shane Ross, Enda Kenny, sure they're all for tax cuts uh, of one sort or another, uh, you know, and, and, and so on and so forth. And the difficulty is of course that it's, it, it's, it's a delusion, it's self-defeating and ultimately it leaves us, Ireland, with one of the lowest tax countries in the EU. I mean, it's really quite extraordinary how we think we can provide for a bigger population, an older population ultimately, and provide all these social services and goods on the basis of a, of a narrow tax base and tax reduction. So I've laboured the point uh, probably too much, but I, I do think it's a very, very important point. Oh yeah, and then I'll finish on this point. You see, the difference between economics and economics is the following. Um, if you're really doing political economy, um, you, 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 you're, you're interested in changing the world. Uh, you know where this came from, don't you? Yeah. It's a Highgate Cemetery in London. Um, um, uh, John Douglas, president of the ICTU, was speaking there last April, I think it was, actually. Uh, yeah, the philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point, however, is to change it. And I think, in a way, particularly those of us working maybe in research and third level as well, I think you know, we have a responsibility to work with other people and to help to change the world and reshape and help, you know, people to think differently and to act differently and we ourselves <clears throat> you know need to be activists in that process so that's why I one of the reasons why I enjoy my job uh, and every now and again I, I, I don't succumb to Leonard Cohen uh, uh, too much okay. thanks um,